Welcome back everybody to another lecture on introduction to soft matter and last time uh, we have started with discussing uh, what are known as constitutive equations right. There are very important class of equations, but they differ from the conservation equations and I had said before that the constitutive equations are approximate and they can uh, often be just phenomenological models for uh, understanding reality right. And what better uh, way to see uh, uh, an approximate relationship than the example of the perfect or the inviscid fluid or the perfect fluid that we are discussing. Right. So, here we have also started uh, introducing the tensor and the vector notation. So, I would like to clarify that the notations that we will use. Here what we will do is since we have started using uh, tensors, we are going to say, let us say you have a variable u. If we do not, if we just write the variable u, then this will imply that it is a scalar quantity. Okay. So, for example, pressure here that is uh, we written without any bar or without any other accompanying symbols. But if you put one small bar underneath, then what it will imply a vector for us. And the same variable if we put a double bar, then this will indicate a tensor. Okay. Now, uh, just to clarify, uh, scalars are actually also considered 0th order tensor and a vector is also considered a first order tensor and a tensor is obviously the generalized form of all this. But in our work, uh, it is important to distinguish uh, uh, that these different quantities uh, between these different quantities. So, we are going to adopt this notation for the rest of this course. Okay. And the imp one of the important quantities we saw was the Kronecker delta. So, what is uh, let we will define this also. Now, Kronecker delta is defined as E i dot as a dot product of two vectors. So, I am going to put one bar underneath each of these and these are unit vectors in ith and the jth direction. Now, the i and jth direction are independent of each other and hence, uh, so this product is also called delta i j and these are all for Cartesian coordinates. So, we will take i comma j as varying from 1 as taking on the values 1, 2 or 3, right. We are talking about 3 dimensional space. So, this quantity so this quantity can take on different values and if i and j are the same if they stand for the same uh, axis then what will happen is this is a dot product of the same unit two unit vectors right in the same direction. So, it takes on a value of 1 when i is equal to j and when i and j are two different vectors or, or vectors in two different directions, then they are also independent of each other. So, the dot product is always 0 when i is not equal to j. Okay. So, we are getting started with our notation and another important uh, point to be noted with this what we will be doing is we will be adopting what is known as uh, notation where a repeated index basically implies summation. Okay. So, for example, so we have written here del i j, i and j are two different indices, right. But we can also write let us say there arises a situation where a is a tensor and when written in component form let us say it is i j and then it is being multiplied with another tensor let us say b and this now has two 
components which are indicated as j and k. Now, you can notice that j is the repeated index here. So, this implies that this entire quantity has to be summed over all the possible values of j. Okay. So, this is basically implying that this quantity is this shorthand expression is the same as this summation. And now, since we have already said j goes from 1 to 3, we can write here j goes from 1 to 3. We will keep our uh, uh, attention focused on the three dimensional space. So, this is good enough for us. Okay. So, that brings us to let us. So, we discussed the topic of the inviscid or the perfect fluid, and you can probably see the chain of thought we are adopting here, right. Uh, what we are trying to do is we introduce the idea of constitutive relationships and we are discussing different forms of constitutive relationships, but you probably know already where we are going to go right. We this is a course on soft matter. So, we are going to look at different constitutive relationships that can hold for viscoelastic materials and we are to build up to that we are trying to look at very very simple constitutive equations and trying to understand those uh, in the process right. So, by the end of this class I hopefully will be able to get to a point where we will discuss some of those uh, important constitutive relationships that you will require in your study of uh, viscoelastic materials. Okay. So, the next uh, constitutive equation will be Fourier's law. Now, if you have taken a heat transfer course this is something that you probably would have seen quite a bit by this time and Fourier's law if you are already familiar with it you probably know that it relates what is known as the heat flux with the temperature gradient. Right? So, there is the, this heat flux is equal to minus k times uh, the gradient of the temperature field. Right? Okay. So, this theta here this denotes the temperature field. and k here denotes thermal conductivity. Now, k uh, I did not write a bar underneath it and the reason for that is it is a scalar quantity for isotropic materials. But if the material is not isotropic, then this k can also become a tensor itself. So, we will just uh, because we are just trying to discuss uh, one and more complicated equations, uh, we do not want to really get into uh, we our objective here is not to understand Fourier's law. So, we will leave it at this. Okay. The next one is what is known as the famous Hookean solid. Now, the concept of the Hookean solid obviously comes from uh, the name Hookean solid is because of it being associated with Robert Hooke, who wrote a very famous original paper. I believe the year was uh, 1678, and this idea has been developed quite a bit after that. So, after uh, Hooke's original papers, this idea was developed by many, many, many uh, scientists, and around 1800s, uh, it was Cauchy. Who, uh, who, wrote, who gave the form of the uh, proper stress tensor to be associated with this. So, it was Cauchy who gave I believe the equation was given around 18, 1820s and he identified a stress tensor which we will call T and this is true for uh, infinitesimal elasticity and this stress tensor can be written as the product of two other tensors where and I will write down what this is, but before I do that I will just write it in component form. Okay. So, this okay, so now I am writing in the component form I do not have to put that. So, this is 
I j. So, this is a stress tensor, it is a second order tensor, whereas C here is actually a fourth order tensor. Okay. So, C goes from I j k L and the strain rate the strain tensor epsilon only takes on it is again a second order tensor. So, here I will put k and l. Okay. So, this is actually c is a fourth order tensor and can account sorry can account can account for yeah, the page here account for an isotropy and we will just clarify what epsilon here is. So, epsilon here is the strain tensor. So, that is just given by right and we will write this in the component form too, but I will just clarify what d is. d is the displacement vector. Okay. Okay. So, I am writing it down here, it is the dis. Okay. It is the displacement vector. And <coughs> these are the uh, small x and capital X. Capital X denotes uh, its location in the reference configuration, x refers to the current configuration. And this uh, epsilon obviously here, it can also be written in the component form as uh, we have been doing before and that we will say if it is i j then let's say it is given by del of d and this will be the other component here and we add the transpose part. So, this just the indices are just flipped now. So, this will now become x i. Okay. So, this is the general form, but uh, for an isotropic material. Okay. So, for an isotropic solid the elastic constants can be reduced to only 2. Okay. So, for an isotropic solid only 2 elastic constants are required. And now and then what happens is that the form of C becomes rather straightforward and if I have to write it in component form. I will write it as okay. This is sorry, I missed one in between C i j k l. Now, this becomes equal to lambda times del i j, and there is another Kronecker delta, but this time the it is the other two indices. This is k l n will give uh, say we are using lambda, let us say mu, okay. and this is del i k and here this is going to be now the other two indices j l and again a Kronecker delta now you have i l. So, if once you have i l what you are left with are j and k. So, these where these two are also called Lame moduli. Okay, so this has now brought us to okay, th this one was number four. So from Hookian solid, I mean, I, you can probably guess where we are going to go next, right? We would want to discuss the case of the Newtonian fluid. So this will be five. The case of Newtonian fluid. Now 
Newtonian fluid is this is a term that you are probably very very well familiar with and the reason uh, Newton's name is associated with it is because uh, very close to Hooke's original work I do not remember the exact year right now but uh, Newton uh, proposed the concept of something called lack of slipperiness which uh, we understand as viscosity and from there on uh, obviously the ideas were developed later on and we had uh, Navier's and uh, Stokes uh, who contributed heavily to the development of the equation which you today know, know as the Navier-Stokes equation right. So let us discuss the Newtonian fluid and it was Stokes who gave the form for the stress tensor for this particular uh, for the case of the Newtonian fluid uh, he, get, he was one of the first to give the proper form and he gave the form this goes to Stokes. So the stress tensor here is now something called P multiplied by the identity uh, tensor and this pressure P is pressure basically then you have some kappa which is a material property plus the uh, multiplied by the trace of D ok. So, this although D is a tensor the trace of D is just a number multiplied by the identity tensor plus 2 eta. So, if I have to write it in component form we have to write it as or now by this time you probably are very familiar with it. So, we have minus p then you have the identity tensor uh, the identity tensor it does not have to be written as i comma I, ij because we already know that this is given by the Kronecker delta right. So, I will just put delta ij and then you have this kappa times this trace of d. So, the trace of d means the sum of the diagonal elements. So, we know that to create a sum all you need to do is to have a repeated index. So, what I can do is I can just write it as d and then I can choose an arbitrary index because this is just going to be summed over. So, I can write it maybe even as i i in this particular case and you have again the identity matrix. So, you have delta i j ok. So, since I am going to write that as delta i j maybe I will choose k here ok otherwise it will become a problem ok. And then you have 2 eta times del ij. So, we have to now specify what dij is. So, this is a what is called as the strain rate tensor which is given by the gradient of the velocity plus the gradient the transpose of that divided by 2. So, this d is also called this is the strain rate tensor. Now, Stokes assumed that uh, this kappa is uh, negative minus two thirds of eta and so that the pure volumetric change does not affect the stress. Furthermore, this particular term the second term here that we see uh, this kappa d uh, k k del i j term can be absorbed in the pressure term ok. And that leads to a more simplified form which is now which can be written as ok. So, I will just say by absorbing the second term we can write it as minus p plus 2 eta and so I chose a uh, uh, by the way I probably want to clarify here. In the Lame moduli, I actually ended up using mu as a Lame moduli. So, that is why I introduced another uh, symbol for viscosity. I believe somewhere uh, in the beginning I had used mu as viscosity also, but now that we have introduced eta, we will just keep on using eta for viscosity, ok. Now, this eta is also called the first uh, 
coefficient of viscosity or shear viscosity. And this kappa is also called the second coefficient of viscosity or bulk viscosity. Okay. So, you can probably see that the chain of thoughts is now going to fructify and we are going to be able to, uh, it is going to bear fruit and uh, we can now introduce some of the more uh, intricate ideas that we want to discuss as part of this course. Right? So, the very fact that we have introduced the Newtonian fluid uh, should beg the question, what is a non-Newtonian fluid? Okay. So, we will just quickly write down that. Uh, this was just a second. So, this was 5. So, I will say 6 here. Non so, a non Newtonian fluid is basically any fluid. which does not obey the equation we just wrote. Okay. So, which does not obey, when we say it does not obey that means that the stress tensor does not obey. Okay. I think that is uh, easy to understand. So, if it does not obey this particular relationship, we will call it as a non-Newtonian fluid. Okay. Now, when you are discussing for example, Navier-Stokes types of fluid, we know that the viscosity is a uh, term, but that viscosity does not actually depend on the strain rate tensor. It is independent. Viscosity is a material property. It can depend on different conditions for example, temperature, but it does not depend on the strain rate tensor itself, which means that if you keep other things constant or other things unchanged, then no matter how fast the flow is I mean, if just loosely saying that uh, no matter how fast the fluid is the how fast the fluid is flowing eta is not going to vary with respect to that okay so here we can now bring in a slightly more generalized idea which is also called inelastic fluids inelastic fluids now, when the phenomena are dictated by viscosity only, then it makes sense to model the viscosity, the function according, accordingly. But in a more generic sense, this viscosity term need not be a constant, right? So, inelastic fluids or generalized Newtonian fluids. are fluids are for which this extra stress tensor. So, if you forget for the example this part right now, uh, then you have this particular part the extra stress tensor that is proportional to the strain rate tensor. Okay. But now that there is constant of proportionality eta is allowed to depend on the strain rate itself. So, maybe I can write down if I have to write down this equation form I can just say that this is now such that I can write down the total stress tensor as being equal to the pressure term plus 2. Okay. So, in a more general, uh, yeah. so this eta now is allowed to depend on the strain rate tensor. But what is this gamma dot that we have written? Okay. So, here uh, by the way, this means that eta is just a function of gamma dot okay it's not being multiplied by that or maybe let me just eliminate chances of confusion where eta is not a constant but depends on gamma dot which is also called which is the generalized 
strain rate. It is something that is derived from the strain rate tensor and it is actually uh, defined as root over of 2 into the trace of d square. So, gamma dot becomes because trace is just a number uh, even though d is a tensor your gamma dot is just a scalar quantity here. Okay. So, these inelastic fluids they have neither memory nor elasticity. So, we have achieved one important com uh, uh, co complication over Newtonian over the simple very very simple Newtonian fluids and that is we have said that this viscosity term can now be a function of the strain rate tensor, but still the entire fluid uh, behavior of the fluid is governed by a viscosity term. Okay. The fluid does not have an elasticity or it, it does not have the ability to store energy in a sense. All the energy that you put in will start to get dissipated immediately. Okay. So, it is important to understand that is why we call it the inelastic fluid which means elasticity is absent. So, in a sense you can see how we are building it up right. We introduced the idea of Newtonian fluid and then we said there is something called the inelastic fluid or the generalized uh, uh, Newtonian fluid and from here on we can build to more complicated ideas. So, one of the easiest ways to understand this is through uh, a diagram. Okay. So, what we are going to try and do now is we are going to cre create a plot and on this axis I have gamma dot which we discussed is the strain rate, the generalized strain rate and here we are going to plot shear. Now, for a Newtonian fluid what do you think would be the relationship between the two? See in the Newtonian fluid the viscosity term is constant, it does not depend on gamma dot. Right? So, the relationship between the two is actually the shear rate is simply proportional to gamma dot and the, pro const the proportionality constant is truly a constant for all values. So, this relationship is given by line. Okay. So, when you plot this and this represents the behavior of a Newtonian fluid. Okay. So, um, this is where we are going to leave it off for this today's class and for the next for the next class we are also going to look at in the same diagram what we are try, going to try and do is plot some of the behaviors of some of the other fluids for example, what we call the shear thickening and the shear thinning fluids which are examples of uh, what we just saw uh, generalized uh, generalized Newtonian fluid or inelastic fluids. Okay. So, we are going to stop here for today's class and then we will carry on from where we left off. Okay, thank you.